So, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to the next session, Further Faster Corporate Climate Action. Um, I think we all know the, the background that uh, we will not reach the ambition of the Paris Agreement, well below two degrees um, to 1.5 degrees, um, without really good collaboration between businesses and policymakers at all levels. Of course, the multilateral process here the national level, which we're all looking forward to seeing the ratchets in the next few years, and states and cities and the investor community. Um, the We Mean Business Coalition, um, led by partners like CDP and the Climate Group, who we're going to hear more from later, and they're, they're, they're very many members in the business and investor community, um, have been working to promote the boldest transformative leadership actions from business on climate change. And there's a, there's, a, there's a little Z card, or Z card as my American colleagues call it, um, out on the table or on the sides. Gives you a, a flavor of what those actions are. More than 600 major global corporations, more adding every week with more than 1,000 bold commitments. And they're representing a market capitalization of well over $15 trillion. So really, the, 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 the big guns um, are in play. Um, and that includes 300 companies um, in fact, well more than 300 companies now who've committed to setting science-based emission reduction targets. I like to think of that as the NDC for business, like what is a business committing to reduce its emissions in line with the Paris goal. So um, our first panel um, will hear about um, what science-based targets means um, uh, from, from Alberto, and then um, uh, we'll, we'll hear from, from Gabrielle and Sarah about actually implementing that in, in companies. Um, and then the second panel, we're going to be talking about the energy transition, um, and we'll have, where we'll have um, Helen talking about the, the suite of very ambitious, 100% transformative um, programs which the Climate Group are running. And then we'll have uh, Sergio, Michael, and Makegu um, talking about their experience from their businesses in very different sectors tackling part of that energy transition. And I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the panels um, again just before I ask them to come up. Um, so we know now that these sort of corporate commitments are driving innovation, which is driving growth, it's helping manage risk better, and it's helping reduce costs. Um, so in each of the panels, we're going to get a chance to learn a bit more about the processes in detail in some of those companies, and also to have a think a bit about how governments might set better policies to make it easier for those companies to implement those very bold commitments and to get more companies on board. But we're going to start by asking Paul Simpson, uh, the co-founder and CEO of CDP, um, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, to share the story of what the data tells us from the, what the biggest companies are telling their investors their plans are for how to deal with climate change. And Paul's going to, um, I think, he's going to be experimenting with some technology. Uh, so good luck, Paul. Um, Paul's going to uh, show us some highlights from the latest CDP report on picking up the pace. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Nigel. Good afternoon, everyone. Well done for the stamina of being here on a Sunday afternoon. It's really very good. It's been a busy day. Um, so as Nigel says, um, what I'm going to do is just take you through some of the latest findings from CDP from the climate change disclosures this year. Uh, about a month ago, we were la launched our new report called Picking Up the Pace, which is really tracking progress uh, of how corporations are acting on climate change and tracking that progress in terms of what needs to be done to deliver the Paris Agreement looking very much at some of the great uh, commitments that we've been working together with women business and the partners on science-based targets renewable energy targets and 100% renewable energy targets carbon pricing so many of you will be familiar with some of this um, and the, the great news that what we've seen um, in in beginning to track how companies are implementing the Paris Agreement is we are seeing positive progress and I'll really explain that with some some visuals shortly um, after Paris we said well how what are we going to track and how are we going to track um, and we came up with an environmentally high impact sample of 1,800 corporations around the world these are the largest corporations globally um, who, some of them are state-owned most of them are big public listed companies who have the largest footprint 
on greenhouse gas emissions because of their sector and their geography and also wider environmental impact. So this is, think of this as really the 2,000 companies that have the greatest impact on climate change in the world. Um, and, th and that's what we've been tracking and we'll come on to that. So um, as Nigel says, I've never done this before. We always like to do something new and experiment at COP. Um, so the, what we're going to take you through is some visualizations. These are all available on the CDP website. We didn't produce a paper report this year, so I, I don't have something to hold up, um, but you're going to see it on the screen. We're trying to do more in digital assets. So I'll just take the, you through this uh, one by one. So what this infographic shows is where are these companies that are disclosing on climate change in 2017. So 1,073 of the 1,800 companies have disclosed. That's really good news. Of course, that means there's some 700 companies who are not disclosing. And then here we can see where are they from. Uh, there's a very strong representation in Europe, I was hoping to have a pointer, but I don't have one. But a strong representation in Europe, in North America, uh, in Japan. Uh, but also we see real rising disclosures in the emerging economies of India, China, South Africa. Um, the, the dots, every dot on here, and you can't really see it that closely, but you can play around on the CDP website, um, represents a company. And the size of the dot represents the emission. So if you look uh, across towards Russia, you see quite a really large dot. That is a Russian electric utility that has a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. If you look in the Gulf of Mexico, you see a relatively large dot. That is Exxon Mobil Corporation, someone everybody knows. Uh, and, and we're not going to do this now, but on the website, if you hover over these dots, it will tell you who these companies are. So we're going to move on to look at the next visualization, please, Regine. Uh, it is working. Wonderful. So now the visualizations, forget the countries. Um, we're just going to really talk about some of the trends we see in Target. So of this disclosing uh, sample of companies, uh, the good news, really good news, is that 89% of the companies, that's all the big red dots, have set and disclosed an emissions reduction target. So it's now a business norm to have an emissions reduction target. There are, of course, 11%, including the Russian electric utility, the very large green dot, that haven't set a target. So um, yeah, this is very positive that we're seeing most companies have set a target. Um, you've got companies in the red dots like NL, the electric utility in Italy, Total and Tata Steel, um, very major companies. And we're going to hear from some of the companies who've set targets in the next panel. So moving on to the next slide on the visualization. Uh, this is really showing, um, getting into a bit of detail now, for big companies who have facilities all around the world, when they're setting a target, it's important to understand not all companies are setting a target for all of their emissions. We want them to set a target for all of their emissions. But again, we see that 75% of the companies, the red dots, have set a target which covers more than 80% of their emissions. And we want everyone to get to a target that is covering all of their emissions. But a number of companies are still struggling with that. Now, we could be critical, but let's not be, um, and really say we know for companies if you're headquartered in Germany, you should have a really good handle on your emissions. But if you have facilities in Kenya, you may not have the same measurement system in Kenya that you've got in your German headquarters, and you're waiting to roll that out to get the 100% emissions. So it's a little bit of a geeky point here, but um, important to understand. So we move on to the next visualization, and this is where it gets really exciting. Um, so you'll all be well aware, and we're going to hear from some of the companies who are, have set or are on the road to setting a science-based target. Um, what we've seen in this uh, picking up the pace report is that 14% of the high-impact companies, that's the purple dots on the left above North America, um, have now committed to set a science-based target. So that, that's good, and that's up from last year, 9%. So th are we seeing the progress of the business world acting to implement the Paris Agreement? Yes. Have we got far enough? No, because the orange dots uh, hovering over Russia, nothing to do with Russia, are all the companies who haven't set uh, have not set a target in line with the science. Um, the exciting news is really the group of companies at the bottom. I'm not even going to comment on the color of that. Um, so what we now find in this sample, uh, while 14% have committed to set a target, it's about 150 companies, some over 300 companies have said that in the next two years they're going to implement 
a science-based target. So this, this is why it's exciting. So because of, of this sample, within two years, before the 2020, when governments come back and ratchet up their ambition, more than half the world's large high-impact companies will have set a science-based target. And there's even more exciting news. If we look at the 6,300 companies that disclosed through CDP this year, some 960 companies, including these 300 here, have said they plan to set a science-based target. So we've seen uh, the business norm of disclosure happen. We've seen the norm of setting emissions reduction target. And my prediction, our prediction, is that by 2020, it will be normal for all of the world's large, well-run businesses to have a science-based target. And we need to do that because then governments will have the, the belief and the ambition uh, to ratchet up their own target. So and we'll move on and just try and hold this in your visual brain. And we move to the next visualization, which is what this looked like in 2016. And the main thing to take away there, that at that point, the biggest group didn't have a target and had no plans to set a target. So we've seen this trend, more and more companies planning to set a target. That's the key takeaway. And we're going to hear from BT and EDP on the next panel. And these are companies like uh, Walmart also setting a target. So the next visualization, please. So um, how long are companies setting their targets for? And I, I appreciate there's a lot of data on here, and you can't really see it all. But what we're really seeing is that you have uh, on the, the left-hand side, 2011, on the right-hand side, 2017. And we are seeing a trend. It's slow that companies are beginning to set targets for the longer term. So in 2011, most companies uh, only had targets either before 2020 or some, the leading ones then, up until 2020. And we're beginning to see this shift to the left-hand side that now most companies have a target out to 2020, where you would expect that because it's not very far away. And any company who hasn't got a target at least to 2020 really needs to get uh, into resetting their target and setting a science-based target. But we're seeing a trend now of companies setting targets out to 2030 and to 2050. And this is what we want to see. We want to see in the next couple of years companies having not just a 2020 target, but a 2030 target and a 2050 target. And clearly that 2050 target, if you want to be ambitious, should be net zero. And the B team are doing some great work on that, which is really, really good. So you know, we're seeing a positive trend, but we still need that pace to pick up on targets. Uh, and we'll go to the next visualization, which is just another way to show this. So, in 2017, uh, you can see, and it's a bit easier to see this way, that most companies' targets are for 2020. Now, again, you know, we need to challenge that that is not far enough away. It's good that we have 2020 targets, but we are seeing this emerging trend um, that, again, many companies setting targets for 2050. Uh, and you know, it's a Sunday afternoon, so we thought we'd challenge your visual brains. So hold this in your visual image. And then we just move to the next image, which shows what that looked like in 2016. Um, and I'm not going to run a test if you can show, tell me what the trends are. Um, but what we are seeing is that shift, that the companies are realizing if you have a target that's pre-2020, you've got to get your act together and get a longer-term target very quickly. So we're not going to use the last visualization because that uh, risk testing your brains a little bit too much. It just shows you 2011. Um, so what we wanted to do here is just show there is a very important trend uh, in more companies setting targets and more companies committing to science-based targets. And these, I think that every company that commits to a science-based target is saying, as a business, we support the Paris Agreement, and we are going to implement it in our operations all around the world, which is really very exciting. Um, it, what does this tell us about how far business is against delivering the Paris agree Agreement to conclude with? Well, if we look at this at the moment, this high-impact sample, we see that the current targets would take business one-third of the way to delivering what Paris needs. Now, that's insufficient. But that's better because it's, last year it was only 25%. So the trend is in the right direction, but we've got to pick up this pace of change so that by 2020 we can say we're 100% of the way. Um, with that, I'll stop because we're going to get into the panel and you're going to hear really about what it's like to set a science-based target. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. And, and 
thank you to the team at CDP for bringing that, bringing that data to life. And for those of you who don't know, CDP um, is an incredibly rich source of data and insights into how companies are thinking about climate change, how it's affecting them, and, and, and how they're planning to um, both address the risks and take the opportunities. Um, so let's get straight into our next panel. I'd like to invite the, the, the panelists to come up to take, take a seat. Um, and we've got Alberto Carrillo Pineda, who's the Director of Science Based Targets at CDP, um, Gabriel um, Guinea, who is the Head of Sustainable Business Policy at BT, and Sarah Goulart, who's the Deputy Director of Climate Environment at, at EDP. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give um, uh, kind of five minutes, roughly, um, of, of their thoughts. We'll start with Alberto to say a little bit, of, a bit more about what science based targets are. I've, I've, I've explained them very roughly, the kind of one floor elevator pitch. Um, Alberto is going to do the kind of skyscraper elevator pitch. Um, and then we'll, we'll hear a bit more about the, the company experience of setting them and how it, how it changes um, company thinking. So Alberto, do you want to do it from there or do you want to come up here? Okay. okay. Thanks a lot, Nigel. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Let me just understand. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, um, the idea is to briefly walk you through uh, this, through the Science Based Targets Initiative, which is uh, this collaboration uh, between uh, four organizations, uh, CDP, the UN Global Compact, WRI, and WWF. And uh, basically, we've been working together for the past uh, three years, promoting precisely the adoption of emission reduction targets that are consistent uh, with the level of ambition set in the Paris Agreement. Uh, as, Nig as Nigel said at the beginning, we started the idea of doing something similar to NDCs, but for companies. And <clears throat> companies basically uh, commit to set a science-based target, and then within two years, uh, companies uh, submit their targets, and uh, targets are validated by a team of experts to make sure that uh, the targets are addressing the main sources of emissions, and also that the level of ambition is consistent uh, with a two-degree world. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, basically how the initiative is working. Uh, <clears throat> we formally launched the Science-Based Targets Initiative ahead of COP21 during the Business and Climate Summit in Paris. And at that time, we had uh, a few companies that had uh, already expressed their interest to set science-based targets through Women Business, uh, who has been kind of our main vehicle uh, to, to bring companies into the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And uh, by COP21, uh, the number of companies had grown uh, almost four times. We had uh, 114 companies uh, committed to set science-based targets. Uh, one year ago, uh, at COP22, we were celebrating 200 companies committed to set science-based targets. And uh, as you can see, the pace is uh, increasing. We reached 300 companies by Climate Week uh, earlier this year, a couple of months ago. And uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, we expect to have many more companies in, in, in the coming uh, two years. Uh, today we have 320 companies committed to set science-based targets. About uh, 75 companies have already th gone through the process of uh, having their targets approved, validated by Science-Based Targets Initiative. And uh, these companies are, uh, have emissions of around 750 million tons per year, which is equivalent to emissions of Canada, and a market capitalization of uh, 6.8 uh, trillion uh, US dollars, which is uh, equivalent to the second largest stock exchange, NASDAQ, or uh, it would be one of the four largest economies. And <clears throat> something important to mention is companies that are part of science-based targets also uh, set targets to reduce emissions across their value chains. So the, the impact that these companies have uh, goes well beyond these 750 million tons. <clears throat> now, uh, how does the spread of companies look like? Uh, we have uh, companies from uh, 36 different countries right now, part of the initiative. And uh, they are spread across all continents. We have uh, right now the majority of companies in Europe. After Europe, we have uh, Asia as the second continent with the largest number of companies, and then North America. Uh, 
And uh, all, all, all these companies are basically representing a variety of sectors, and uh, they're really uh, influencing all value chains. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I would say just, just to finalize uh, this brief introduction, uh, these 320 companies are really a good reason and a good testimonial to believe that uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement is already happening uh, <clears throat> in the real economy. And you know, all these companies, when they set science-based targets, of course, they th these targets have normally approval from the board. So these discussions are reaching uh, the board level. They are, of course, shaping the way in which these companies operate, and they are affecting their, su their supply chains and their value chains. Uh, <clears throat> These uh, 320 companies show also that science-based target setting is becoming uh, a new normal within the business sector. And uh, we heard already that uh, over uh, 900 companies are planning to set uh, science-based targets in the next two years. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, 300 of these companies are within the largest companies uh, in the world. And of course, uh, these companies also represent an opportunity for governments to step up and uh, set the level of ambition that is consistent with this. I think this, this is kind of an unprecedented opportunity uh, for governments to, to seize the leadership of, of these companies and uh, to create a uh, level playing field for all companies to move in the same direction. Uh, <clears throat> that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Um, great, now I'm gonna ask Gabrielle to give us the, the perspective from BT. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about um, BT's climate action journey. Um, BT's role in, in combating climate change is threefold. Firstly, to reduce our carbon emissions in line with international policy. Secondly, to help others reduce their carbon emissions through using our products and services. And thirdly, to share knowledge collaborate and inspire others to take action. We have a long-standing ethos to be a sustainable and responsible business leader, and this slide illustrates some of the things that we have done. Our environmental sustainability journey actually started already back in 1992, and that's 25 years ago now, when we first began to measure our corporate carbon footprint and set our first reduction target. Setting meaningful goals along our journey has always been key. We were one of the first companies in the world to set a science-based target. In 2008, we set a goal to cut our carbon emissions intensity by 80% uh, by 2020 against the 1996-97 baseline. We actually achieved this goal four years early um, last year. So on my way back on the train from, from COP in Paris, I started thinking about setting a new target based on a one and a half degree uh, scenario. I then began working with the Carbon Trust to model what a one and a half degree tra trajectory would look like for BT. And this turned out to be a target uh, to reduce our scope one and two carbon emissions intensity by 87% by 2030, and also to reduce the carbon emissions associated with our supply chain by 29% uh, in the same time frame. And I'm delighted that this target has been approved by the Science-Based Target Initiative. Um, we also have at BT a net positive goal, which is to demonstrate that our negative carbon impact on the world is outweighed by our positive impact. We call this our three to one goal, which is to help our customers reduce their carbon emissions by at least three times the end to end impact of our business. So when we look at our business and the one, we include the carbon emissions from our own operations, which is around 7%. Um, the carbon impact of customers using our products and services, uh, which is 26%, and the carbon associated with our supply chain, which is 68%. 
And then our positive impact in the three, we include services like audio and video conferencing and smart transport applications, which help people reduce travel and therefore reduce emissions. Uh, also last year, our, the revenues from our net positive portfolio totaled 5.3 billion pounds. That's actually around 22% of BT's total revenue and a 1.7 billion growth on the previous year. And we achieved a ratio of 1.8 to 1. As the carbon impact from our supply chain is so large, we have specifically focused on looking at how, how we can reduce that. We have over 18,000 suppliers, and our annual supply chain spend is 14 billion pounds. In 2013, we launched a climate change policy which set three minimum requirements on any company wanting to do business with BT. That the supplier has a climate change policy, that they measure and report carbon emissions, and that they have a carbon reduction target and report on progress. We engage with our suppliers through the CDP supply chain program, and we also work with them through something we call the BT Better Future Supplier Forum, which is our program to drive sustainability performance improvements and assessments in our supply chain. So finally, what's, what's next uh, for BT? Uh, we are working on detailed business cases and plans to meet our new 2030 targets. Uh, we have launched a project to look at how our products and services can help achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We will continue to work with suppliers on sustainability and work to scale our Better Future Supplier Forum and to get more suppliers reporting into CDP. And we've also recently launched a campaign to get our suppliers to buy uh, renewable energy. And we will also, of course, continue to share what we've learned on the way with people like you guys. So thank you. Th thank you, Gabrielle. I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to digest the, the level of ambition of setting a target to reduce by 80%, achieving that, and then setting a target to reduce by another 87%. So that's like, you know, you go from 100 down to 20, and then you reduce by 87% on the 20, which is going down to, you know, 3 or 4% left from what you started with. So that's incredible. So um, thank you. And really great to hear about you um, raising the bar of leadership to a 1.5 degree trajectory. So. Wonderful. So a very different industry now. I'm going to ask um, Sarah to tell us about um, the electric utility journey from the perspective of EDP in Portugal. Thank you. The, the significant different challenge that I'm facing here. Okay. First the slides. Well, uh, as a starting point, I would like to introduce the company. Probably most of you don't know about it. We are, we are a company... Uh, with headquarters in Lisbon, Portugal. Although we are spread around 14 other countries, we have generation, distribution, and retail. Generation, uh, around 25 gigawatts installed capacity. We have uh, from which already 72% are renewable, but we still have coal and gas. We have grids, and we have them in South uh, Europe, in Iberia, and we have them in Brazil as well and we have retailed more than 11 million customers. How do we see climate? It's embedded in our strategy. We've been working with renewables for a long time now. Uh, we have these four areas where we, that they are priority for, for us. So under in innovation, it's key to keep on working on clean technologies, also on smart grids, storage, which is a major challenge that we have, and client low-carbon solutions. Mitigation is part of our growth strategy now. The portfolio of renewables is increasing. We want to keep on growing this path, uh, but also growing on efficiency and within, with our customers, helping them with their own efficiency and supporting them through low-carbon solutions. Adaptation is also important. We are a based a, a utility provides a basic need, so it's uh, very important for us not only to de-risk, so climate risks are incorporated here, but we can also see it 
in the midterm as a, a solution for our clients. So this could be, it can be a, a business opportunity as well. So adaptation plays an important role here uh, for a utility perspective. And finally, we want to keep on sharing what we've been doing, uh, not only with police policymakers and investors, which are a very important target for us, but also with our clients. It looks easy to feel that uh, clients see the, the efficiency in their business and they will just go and get them, but that's not as easy as it feels. So sometimes you really think the, the business is there for them, but they just don't see it. So we really need to keep this and raise this awareness among Small, smaller companies that can benefit from this, and they have a business case, and if, nevertheless, sometimes it's difficult. Well, and so we've met, we decided to set several targets, mid-term, short-term, mid-term, and long-term targets for us. Uh, on the innovation part, we committed ourselves to invest to 200 million euros between 2015 and 2020, and we will achieve now 75% uh, of our portfolio will be renewable in 2020, as well as we will be saving more than one terawatt hour of energies from our to, to our clients. And 2020, in 2030, then, we will be reducing our CO2 emissions by 75%. And that time, hopefully, although our commitment, public commitment, is 90% of smart grids in Iberia, personally, I hopefully think that we'll be able to achieve 100%. And in 2020, will we become CO2 neutral? So, science-based targets. We, we knew about the initiative after setting the commitments. And so, we started trying to understand that this would be a very important uh, recognition for us because it links our ambition. It, it gives, uh, it, gives a, a cl it clarifies the level of ambition of a company. We had several challenges. First, we had to change our baseline, and that's why the, the commitment that is uh, really recognized by science-based target, it's, it's the same, but it has a different baseline. Uh, and you can see in the graph that it corresponds to. And also, we, we had to set a commitment on scope three. So this was a requirement for the initiative, and we committed to reduce it 25% on scope three as well. So this is what I have to tell you for now. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Th thank you, Sarah. I'm particularly struck by the power of, of, of big round numbers for communicating strategy, you know, at 200 million euros, 75% reduction. I, I agree with you, 100% smart meters would be, yeah. would, would be nice, right? One, one of the things that Steve Howard, one of the founders of um, Women Business always, always, always says is that um, if you set like a 50% target or a 60% target or a 90% target, uh, then m let's say you set a 90% target, he'd say then about 40% of the people think they don't have to do anything. So the clarity of a zero or a hundred is really helpful. Um, uh, I'd just like to, to see if we could, um, from, from Gabriel and, and Sarah, get a couple of examples of, you know, these are very big, scary, transformational targets you're setting. You know, 80%, 90%, kind of 75%. Um, how do you turn what could be an overwhelming signal to companies that are always struggling with multiple challenges? You know, it's not like this is the only thing that anyone in operations has got on their plate. How do you, you know, what, what, what's, how do you, how do you, in kind of process terms, and maybe give us a couple of examples, turn those into um, the kind of the exciting innov innovation, the sort of turn that into a DNA of innovation? Maybe you've got some war stories of how big targets drive innovation. I think that'd be really interesting to, to hear from you. 
So I think we, we just, uh, our new 2030 target, we, we just launched it about a, a month or so ago. And actually what helped in, in the process of getting the business behind it was to refer to the target, uh, the science-based target we set in 2008. Because when we set that 80% reduction target, we had no idea how to meet it. And I think setting these targets really helps to drive the business and, and for, to motivate them. So what we found in, in meeting our, our last target was really, you know, a team to focus on, on driving energy efficiency in our networks, in our buildings, installing smart meters, for example. So since 2009, we have saved 220 million pounds on our energy bill. So I think that's the kind of thing, once you've set that target, the business c tends to, to innovate and start thinking about how are we actually going to do that. And I, I guess once you've got a track record of that innovation delivering that kind of cost savings, it makes the next step up target more easier to set because people can see the value. Thank you, Gabrielle. Sarah. Oh, well, to, to achieve these targets, obviously we need innovation. There's huge change, the challenges that we're still facing. Uh, when we're talking about innovation and those areas that I focus, if we're talking about cleaner energies, you still have challenges that we are talking about uh, land constraints that you might have. You, of course, are looking about efficiency that you have to try to improve, or you can be talking about another huge challenge for utilities, which is intermittency of the renewables. So for that, uh, we've been investing in like solar floating devices that we add into our hydropower reservoirs that cannot, can, will av avoid land use and also benefit from the grids. And we have wind flow devices that we, we've been investing in because there are countries where the, the traditional offshore solutions are not an option because the waters are very deep. So with wind float solution, you just open the market, the potential market for wind very, very significantly. And you also avoid land constraints that you will have in the future. So these are examples or to, to address intermittency, which is really a challenge for, for us. You start mixing the technologies and mixing wind with solar, solar and wind with storage. So this is the, the, the things that we try and keep on doing to meet these kind of challenges. And we also have the demand side. I don't know if I have the time to talk about it. But the demand side that th this is a business that is switching very, very rapidly. And so smart grids will bring the intelligence to deal with a complex system that will be decentralized. And for that, we have now 10 cities where we are piloting uh, smart grids. We started in Lisbon. We have it, not in Lisbon, apologies, in, in Evra, in Portugal. It's a mid-sized city. We scaled it up to 10 other cities in Spain and in Brazil as well. And what we do is we test several technologies in a broader and holistic way to understand how, how they can complement themselves, themselves. And here we are talking about low carbon solutions. They are key for clients. And how can we storage uh, penetration of electrical vehicles, uh, well, housing and well, a lot of stuff. <laughs> but it's but, a challenge. So sorry, but it's really interesting. What you've just described there is a is a fundamental shift from basically being a generator and distributor to being a much more of a holistic kind of systems provider and, and starting to see some new links, I mean, with the demand management and software becoming much more important. And, sure. and you just mentioned transport. And Gabriel, I think you mentioned that you were doing some innovation around smart transport. So I, one thing that's really intriguing to me is that as we go through these disruptive changes, it's not just individual sectors that are being disrupted, but there are new kind of intersections so that transport, software, and power are all kind of becoming one mega sector in some way. So Gabriel, just say a little bit more about the innovation around smart transport. Might also, might also give some, some clues for the EV100 conversation later on. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, sure. Um, so, you know, as we as we looked at our 2030 targets, and, and you mentioned, Nigel, you know, that there are already so many things that we've done. So what do we have left to do? Um, 
I don't know, BT actually has a fleet uh, of 33,000 vehicles, which is our engineers going out and installing fiber optics or, or installing uh, routers in people's homes. And you know that, that's going to be the big challenge for us and, and really thinking about you know, policy environments is, is we need the innovation. You know, we need big, heavy vans, not just uh, personal cars. So how do we get you know, the, the charging infrastructure? How do we get um, vehicles that are fit for purpose um, and, and you know, at, at a cost which is affordable? So I think that's going to be a big one. Another one is going to be around renewable energy. Uh, we've been buying 100%, we buy 100% renewable energy in the UK, but we also have an ambition to buy 100% renewable energy worldwide. And, you know, coalitions like RE100 have obviously really helped, but there's, there's more that we need to do in that space around renewables. Great. Let me just ask one, one last question to, do you want to respond also to the point about power and vehicles? Uh, well, I think that we have to speak more with each other because <laughs> some can have the solutions and well I think there's there's a link between the customers and the service the providers uh, that we have to to try and put those people together because there's a lot of learning a learning curve here yeah. maybe on the next panel we talk a bit more about okay. some of those links also between what companies can do and what policymakers mm -hmm. do in terms of enabling just just to wrap up um, Alberto see we, we've 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 been talking about this as though it's the, the only impetus comes from companies wanting to improve. But of course, at CDP, you're, you know, you're, you're operating very much on behalf of the global investor community. And the Carney Bloomberg Task Force are asking companies to say a lot about how they're dealing with climate change. Do you, do you see an alignment between that task force and this, this, this new normal of science-based targets? Thanks, Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, to, I think it's actually one of the main drivers uh, for companies to adopt science-based targets. Uh, we have, of course, now uh, the recommendations uh, from the TCFD um, asking companies uh, to do scenario analysis. And I think the real, um, I mean, the main driver and the main question that shareholders and stakeholders have is, is this company uh, fit for a low carbon economy or not? And I think science-based targets is a, is a good way to respond to that because it's basically a company saying, yes, we are gonna get there and we may not be fit now, but we are gonna get there. So I think it's a very powerful way for companies to respond to shareholders and to stakeholders and of course uh, to, to make the adjustments that are necessary to, to, to be there basically. Okay, great, great. That's good to hear. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with that task force, that's relatively new recommendations. It's it's, a, it's one of the um, Women Business um, act, Take Action Framework commitments. It's, it's run by the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, which is itself is an impressive collaboration. So well worth looking into because if you haven't heard from investors, I know I was speaking to a cement company yesterday, and they were saying that, that they're starting to hear about this. They're just starting to hear about it from investors, but they're expecting some very strong guidance and we've already seen some investors say that they will vote against company reports if they're not following the um, uh, the guidance of the TCFD. So I think you, I, I agree, it seems to me that's going to be a big driver of this. So um, um, sorry we've run out of time. Um, it's re been really great to hear about the, the new normal of science-based targets and particularly how it's driving not just great ambition but, but, but great cost savings and great innovations um, within the businesses and, and for clients. So I'd like to th thank our first panel and we'll move on to the next panel. Thank you, guys. So um, we've been hearing about the, 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 the new normal of raising the overall level of ambition to be in line with the Paris Agreement being within two degrees or even um, BT 1.5 degrees. Um, so we're now going to do a deeper dive into a big part of the problem, big part of the challenge, big part of the opportunity, which is the energy systems. Um, I'm going to ask the, the, the panel to jo join me on stage now. And the panel is uh, Helen Clarkson, is the CEO of the Climate Group, um, who will be able to give us an overview of the, the, the family of programs which the Climate Group are running, which are all about 100%. Um, and then uh, Sergio uh, Carter, who's the Vice President of Sustainability Management Division at RICO. Um, Michael Lightfoot, the Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Lease Plan, and Makegu Mabunda, the Sustainability Specialist at Woolworth Holdings. So we'd like you to um, join us all on stage. 
and we'll get stuck into the energy systems transition. Yeah. And we've got, we've got a really nice mix of sectors and geographies um, and different slices of the energy system. So Helen, take, take us away by sharing a little bit about um, the, the, this, this wonderful family of the, the, the 100 Club that the, 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 the club Climate thing. Group is running. Yeah, so the Climate Group mission is to accelerate climate action and to drive the world to under two degrees C climate change without delay. And the way that we work, the key ways that we work, is by creating these networks, these coalitions of action, of business, of subnational governments. And we put commitments, really aggressive commitments, at the center of that work with the partners to help them deliver it. We don't just make them make a con commitment and walk away. We do peer learning, uh, sharing, connecting with one another. Um, and then we use transparency to check how people are doing. So we work with CDP, for example, on RE100. And then we use communications both to celebrate success and drive more ambitious action. So it's supposed to form a, a virtuous circle of ambition. Um, and so you can see these three campaigns that we run here um, connected together on this, on this vision RE100, so we run that in partnership with CDP. That's a commitment to 100% renewable electricity. We've got over 100 companies now committed. Uh, this week we announced HSBC joining that, so it's growing all the time. EP100, so that's doubling energy productivity. Um, we run that uh, with the Alliance um, to save energy, um, and that's really around creating a corporate commitment there about doubling. And then EV100, which is the newest of these, um, we launched it just a few weeks back in September in New York, um, and it's already, we had four new members joining this week, so that's really um, taking off. I'm trying to avoid uh, driving metaphors there where I can. Uh, but essentially what that commitment is, is, is companies choosing between either making a commitment around their fleet or around infrastructure for customers and um, staff. So the commitment in there is a bit more flexible. It's very aggressive still, but we have to find the one that works for their business model. Um, and I'm sure Mike's going to talk more about that. So when you take those together, I think it both links to the science-based target. It creates a platform um, for action it helps companies go about starting to deliver on their science-based target, but also creates a suite of um, commitments that's really about, as we said there, the sort of 21st century low-carbon leadership. So those are the 100 ca campaigns. I think we're going to hear from uh, one member of each of those now. Yes, great. Thanks, Helen. Um, very simple idea. 100% sounds so easy. Um, but we've got three companies here who've made some very bold commitments. So we'd like to ask each of them now, one by one, to give a sense of um, who they are, um, what the company is, and just a little bit about why you've chosen to make this big public commitment and maybe a little bit of the I experience along the way so far. So we start with Sergio Cato from, from Rico. Yeah, please feel free. And is there a, we got the, yeah, it should just be the, the okay. green triangle. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very proud of here uh, to, uh, to talk about our challenges. And uh, let me go through. So today, I'd like to share with you our new environmental goals and the participation in uh, Renewable Energy 100. And uh, as you may know, we are the IT company, ICT companies. Uh, we are providing a solution for offices, but recently we are expanding our scope, not only the offices, but also the more front, front line workplaces and also the social issues such as SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So thanks to our long commitment of the environmental management, uh, we have been uh, elected, selected uh, by the uh, uh, United Nations and the French government for the COP21 uh, official sponsor, and we are very proud of the supporting the COP21. And please remember the first Paris Agreement edition printed by RICO. <laughs> So, uh, after the Paris Agreement and the SDGs launch, uh, we have uh, set our materialities and uh, related to the sustainability goals, uh, sustainable development goals, and uh, we set and also the zero carbon emission, zero carbon society and the uh, circular economies target. So, uh, 
based on uh, uh, Paris Agreement and the SDGs, uh, we, we have set the environmental declaration, our vision, to achieve zero carbon and 100% circular economy. And in order to achieve, uh, it means, so by the 2050, our uh, gr greenhouse gas emission should be zero. That is our commitment. And in order to achieve the zero emission, definitely we have to utilize, optimize our renewable energies uh, into our operation proactively by deploying, of course, the CO2 reduction uh, drastically. In order to achieve the 2050s zero emission, we definitely consider the renewable energy 100%. That's why uh, I really appreciate uh, to have a renewable energy 100 initiative uh, that encouraged us a lot. And uh, also we could set our target uh, correctly thanks to the guideline of the Renewable Energy 100 initiative. And the reason to join the 100% renewable, uh, definitely uh, we wanted to encourage our internal people uh, to move forward for the, any development of the businesses and also the development of the technologies for saving and renewable energies. And also they encourage the, let's say, to deploy the re renewable energy and the saving energies related to business uh, for our growth uh, strategy, and also to improve our recourse, uh, let's say, evaluation by uh, respecting the ESG investment, et cetera, et cetera. So, but last but not least, we also would like to encourage the innovation development by energy procuring companies in Japan to provide us the renewable energy infrastructure. That is a, a, as a demand side, so we wanted to uh, promote the renewable energy in Japan. At that time, we have set four policies and five, uh, three uh, strategies. Firstly, we always think about not only the, let's say, uh, sustainable planet, but also uh, as an economic uh, benefit we consider, such as more growth, less risk, lower cost, and more trust. Then based on that, uh, we have set to the three strategies. One is, okay, uh, we developed save, uh, saving and uh, renewable energy technologies, and relate, uh, also that uh, we would like to deploy and encourage the renewable energy related businesses and last but not least, also, we would like to optimize renewable energy in our operation. We are now already started from this year, a lot of initiatives, and we are setting uh, the, also the solar panel plant in, in many countries, etc., etc. And these kind of activities, not only RICO, but also we are, uh, let's say, uh, collaborating with many com companies. And in Japan, we have, uh, let's say, Japan Climate Leaders Partnership uh, Coalition. So we are talking about renewable energy, EV100, EP100, how to deploy these kind of things for our future. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Really, again, really nice crit. Crisp strategy and lots of lots of keep seeing lots of collaboration. You know, you talk about the Japanese CLP, and I think you just you skated over that. But I think that's really nice. You had the vision of Japan as a net zero society, and it's great to hear a leading business pushing pushing that ambition. I want to come back to you with some some questions afterwards about um, some of, some of the challenges in in, in getting there. Um, so I'd like to turn to, to to Michael now. Michael from Lease Plan to talk about EV100. Super, thanks so much. Um, so for you guys who don't know, Lease Plan is one of the world's largest car leasing companies. I think we have 1.6 million cars on the road uh, in 32 countries worldwide. Um, we joined uh, EV100 as a founding partner in September, um, another panel like this. Um, uh, why did we do that? 
I mean, there are, there are a number of reasons. Number one is, and this is not news to anyone in this room, on this panel, you know, we think this is the right thing to do. Um, you know, we all know that the automotive sector produces emissions. These emissions cause climate change. They also damage the quality of air in our towns and cities. You know, Lease Plan is a responsible company. We want to do what we can to drive down those emissions. You talked earlier about a kind of big, bold, you know, target and how, how they are good in terms of motivation. Well, we've set our own big, bold target. Uh, we've said that we'd be net zero in terms of emissions by 2030. And as you can imagine, you know, for, for an automotive company, that's quite, <laughs> that's quite an ambitious strategy, right? So actually, we really welcome initiatives like EV100 that raise the agenda and, you know, put it on people's profiles to say, OK, you know, we need to make the switch. So, so that's kind of driver number one. It's the right thing to do. We want to be a responsible partner in tackling climate change and, uh, you know, working towards the objectives of the Paris Agreement. But you know, that's not the whole story. The whole story is that it's about business for us. We are increasingly seeing that our customers are coming to us and saying, guys, we want you to help us make the switch to electric vehicles. Now, why do they do that? They do that for three key reasons. Number one, because it's sexy. Um, electric cars are cool. Um, you know, who doesn't want to drive a Tesla? I certainly do. I asked my boss for one. I haven't got one yet. Um, uh, it may happen after this. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sexy, it's a branding thing. Companies all have kind of, you know, sustainability strategies. This is one of the most visible ways that you can associate, you know, yourself with the sustainability movement. Um, you know, that's kind of driver one. Driver two is that actually it's a very significant part um, or a significant ingredient in helping those companies achieve their own uh, sustainability ambitions. I think 20% of global emissions today come from the automotive sector. Half of the country, half of the cars on the road today are registered to companies. You guys do the maths, but it's at least between five and 10% of global emissions come from cars owned by companies. So they can make a big impact there by moving towards zero emission transport and make a big impact on their own um, uh, sustainability strategy. So really kind of significant. And then the third area is uh, a bit more negative. That's okay, regulation. Um, you talked earlier about the task force on uh, climate related disclosure. That's kind of interesting, but in a very much more practical sense. I mean, we really see the proliferation of uh, low emission zones across Europe. Uh, that basically means you can't drive dirty old cars into the center of, you know, you know, some of our most important and large economic uh, capitals and towns and cities. So if you want to safeguard your business continuity, you have to move to a low emission vehicle. It's that simple. So, you know, they're the there's some of the drivers and dynamics around why we why we joined EV100. Um, uh, in terms of the practical action that we're taking, um, uh, obviously, if we're going to achieve our net zero ambition target, we have to make steps very quickly in moving our customers over to low emission vehicles. So to, to facilitate that, we don't just provide them the cars. That doesn't work um, because you know to, to, to drive uh, a low emission vehicle, you also need the charging infrastructure. So what we do is we provide the, the cars themselves, we provide the charging infrastructure, we also, and this is really important, provide the kind of internal education tools to show, you know, this is what it means to go electric, this is what happens, you know, you won't be like that woman in Black Books uh, or Black Mirror on Netflix who she gets stuck and, you know, uh, abandoned halfway because her car runs out of juice. You know, th these are the, some of the things that we do to, uh, to help you kind of get around those issues. Um, so really kind of a full package solution. Um, and you know, we also understand that our customers won't make a switch in terms of their total fleet straight away. You know, the industry doesn't work like that. You make steps over time. Um, but what we want to do is kind of engage them with the idea of electric mobility, you know, uh, help them understand the challenges, the benefits. So we've also just, uh, on Friday actually, we launched our EV pilot proposition for, for large corporates. And we basically say, you can take as many uh, cars as you want. We'll provide the charging infrastructure. We provide the engagement tools. So it's, we want to make it as simple as possible for, for everyone to go electric and wipe out millions of tons of carbon in the process. Now, where does EV100 fit into all this? Um, obviously, there are lots of moving parts you know, in making the uh, you know, sustainable mobility 
paradigm shift. You know, we have a role to play, the regulators have a role to play, the infrastructure companies have a role to play, the energy companies, everyone. So what EV100 is great at doing is bringing together all those different people, you know, creating a real coalition of action and making sure it's on the agendas of all the right people. So the policy makers, the regulators, but also really importantly, the CEOs, because I really think over the past few years, People have not woken up to the impact that um, cars, in particular, can have on the overall achievement of the Paris Agreement um, uh, targets. And that was why it was so good in New York that we had, you know, governors, mayors, ministers, CEOs, all in the room, all really aware. Um, uh, you know, and, and since then, we've had so many people come to us to say, you know, how can you help us go electric? So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where the EV100 stuff fits in. We're a real proud partner. It's helped us, us a lot, and we hope that we can also help facilitate the other companies that want to go electric. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, one, you, you mentioned the emissions free zones. I mean, one, one, some people, you know, we've also partnered with the C40 group of leading cities and just a couple of weeks ago 12 of those cities um, announced a commitment to two things one that from 2025 they'll only buy electric buses so basically the the, the internal combustion engine bus is, is a is a yeah. is a dying animal very quickly because those are the biggest cities in the world and that why well, I, I, I expect that to go through all all of the c40 cities because they're all committed to 1.5 degrees and secondly they said that significant low emission well they will have significant zero emission zones i no internal combustion engine vehicles allowed by 2030. These are quite big. They're early. There's only nine cities, but they're very big cities. They're quite big market signals. Just, 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 before, just before we go to um, Makega and talk about EP100, I wonder, Helen, could you just explain a little bit more about the, the kind of ecosystem approach? Because if you, even when you just look at the first 14 companies you've committed, they, they fall into some quite different buckets in terms of type of company and really with the, how they interact with the, 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 the with vehicles. Yeah, so as I explained, the, the way that EV100 works is there's two sorts of commitments. One is to infrastructure and one is to their own fleet. And the fleet can be either leased or bought and the infrastructure is either for customers or staff. So it looks at if you're a retailer, actually IKEA have made all four commitments. And so the idea is to fit with um, your business model and do the thing that's the most ambitious. But together you need all those different parts of the system to move. So it's about sending a demand signal to the automotive industry industry to say, look, the demand is here from big companies, we need to up the amount of production and to give them the security that that demand signal is there. But at the same time, we know that another barrier to EV uptake is people worrying, well, am I just going to run out of juice somewhere? I haven't seen that episode of Black Mirror. Yeah. Um, I'll check that out, but then that'll give me fear about EV100. But the idea is that it tackles that, right? So getting over this barrier. And if you think of someone like IKEA, um, people often know in where I live, where your nearest IKEA is, so you could know that you could turn up there, go and get your meatballs, get your car charged, you know, it becomes a kind of less worrying thing than thinking, well, how am I going to get this to happen? And so it's using those strengths of, say, retailers who have that big spread to, to really push out the infrastructure. So, I mean, I, 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 I see, I just was just looking, because I was with a, a vehicle manufacturer the other day, telling them that they should be keeping an eye on this, and actually, and, and telling them about lease plan and, and you know, your 1.6 million vehicles that are going to be electrified. And I noticed that you, um, there's a fourth category in there. So you've got the people with big fleets, like Deutsche Post, anyone from Germany, that's a pretty big fleet, um, um, or lease plan. There, there's the customers like IKEA, Metro RG, again, big German, um, supermarket companies, so um, they'll be implementing the charging infrastructure for their clients, and then staff, companies like Unilever, who'll be introducing it. But there's an interesting fourth category, back to the earlier point about how systems are converging, you, you've got some uh, electric utilities joining already, right? I think uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and, mm. and Vattenfall. So it's interesting, although they're electrifying their fleet, there's also a I mean, the electrification of vehicles is kind of a good deal if you manufacture electricity, right? Yeah, and I think the other point about it is, is that we, and we're starting to really think about this and how we're going to link it to our state and regional work is that in order to get the full benefit, it's got to be tied to renewable energy. So that's when we are going to get the big kind of breakthroughs in that, in that triangle. And so we're starting to look at, okay, well, how do you get this kind of combination of the right regulation in the right places with the right companies? And, and that's really where our work is going to go as we take it forward. Great, thanks, Helen. So um, the, the the third member of the hundred club 
um, uh, EP100, Makeku Mabunda from, from Woolworth Holdings. Tell us your, your story. Thank you. I'll go through my slides very quickly because I've got a two minute video that I want to show you at the end. So we are known to be really good storytellers at Woolworths. Um, so this is just to give you a big, um, a brief overview of um, who we are. So we call our sustainability um, strategy the good business journey. We operate under the Woolworths Holdings uh, Limited umbrella. We've got three entities, Woolworths South Africa, David Jones, and Country Road. David Jones and Country Road are based in Australia, and I'm representing Woolworths South Africa, which is based in um, South Africa, Cape Town. So we have the most ambitious um, vision to be one of the most sustainable retailers in the world. We just recently, uh, recently changed it. It was to be one of the most sustainable retailers in the Southern Hemisphere. But we decided go big or go home. <laughs> and why this journey? Uh, we recognize that our operations impact everything from raw materials to how our products are used and um, discarded. We have eight focus areas <coughs> across, across the entire business with over 200 targets and we have compressed the 200 targets into five pillars and in 2015 we set these uh, goals for 2020, energy being one of them to have our energy impact by 50% by 2020 as well as source um, all our energy from renewable sources by 2030. And because of this, we were the first major retailer in um, globally to sign up to the EP100 campaign. Oh. So the journey thus far, in 20, 2004, we set a benchmark. Um, I apologize for the slide. It's been distorted a bit, technology. Um, so we set our benchmark for energy efficiency and reduction. And currently, we're working on setting our science-based targets. Um, <laughs> yay. <laughs> um, Alberto's <laughs> grinning in the front row here. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll hopefully sign up for RE100. Um, Alan's grinning in the stage. <laughs> and like I said, um, we're part of the EP100 uh, campaign. And um, yeah, everything is driven by national and global commitments. For us, being part of um, the EPRE or uh, EV100 campaigns, for us, it's more about accountability. So if you are not in, then, um, I mean, you're just faffing by yourself somewhere in the dark. So it's about that accountability and having peers to share uh, the journey with and uh, the mentorship that comes with it um, and, and the support and learning from, from each other. We can't do this by ourselves and we recognize that. So our key initiatives um, in terms of our energy or sustainability journey, we do life cycle, cycle assessment so we know where our products come from, what the impacts are, and for most of our products, uh, it lies in the supply chain. So even though we're setting or we're planning to set our science-based targets, we're only um, currently focusing on the scope one and scope two emissions because we unfortunately don't have um, a clear view of where exactly or how big the, well, we'll know how big the supply chain is, but how to engage um, the players in our supply chain uh, for products we source all over the world. So it's going to be quite challenging, but it's a journey that we are willing to, to take. And we also have energy efficiency um, initiatives within our corporate buildings. Supply chain, that's distribution and farming in South Africa. We source 92 or over 92 percent of our products, food products from South Africa. So we have a very good um, understanding of what the impacts are there, working with over 98 percent of our suppliers or farmers um, in um, 
sustainability initiatives, including um, managing um, energy, as well as uh, product innovation within our textiles. Um, we're starting a journey or we're embarking on a journey to work with some of our suppliers on uh, reducing the energy impact of our products. So that's from sourcing to um, handling and as well as the collective action that comes with signing up to programs such as EP100, um, accountability, uh, transparency, reporting to the CDP, and we also encourage our employees and customers to engage with, that, with us. So we're very open to criticism or any positive accolades that they may have. The progress thus far, um, we've reduced our energy impact by 43% since our 2004 uh, benchmark. And that's for stores, um, general letting area. And the target, like I said, it's 50% by uh, 2020. And we have a internal green, green star rating for some of our stores or for our stores and 122 um, meet that criteria currently and we became the first retailer uh, to be certified by the Green Building Council um, of South Africa. So we've got one green store which is five star rated currently. I think we're working on getting six stars but um, yeah I won't say much on that now. Um, the shared resilience for us basically means um, recognizing that we are a key player in the ecosystem. We are bound by national mandates. Innovation comes with exploring the alternatives and that's where we need partnerships. We have a responsibility to the community. We work with the people, hence um, joining campaigns such as EP100, as well as partnering, we cannot do it. Uh, by, by ourselves. So I hope my video plays to just like encapsulate what we are as a company or who we are as a company. We're on a journey to make a positive change in the world. to look after our people, communities, animals, and planet. Farms in South Africa feed our nation. We have to help our farmers look after their resources and support them. Because their business is our business, and their success is our success. Our food needs to nourish our bodies. It's not just what you put in, it's what you leave out. Our communities need our support. We help teachers and learners grow their own food. Our kids' growth is our country's growth. We support learning in the classroom and make it easier for you to help learners too. Everyone deserves an opportunity to thrive. Opportunity builds prosperity and empowerment. Our mission is to create sustainably, to make sure we look after the earth. We give new life to discarded things and let less go to waste. Less water, less energy. Water sustains us. Without it, there isn't life. Our mission is to conserve it. We only have one planet, and we need to keep its heart beating, so that it can keep our hearts beating. Our good business journey started 10 years ago, and it's only just begun. So that's the good business journey. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. You're, you're, that, those, all those beautiful images of, um, of, of farming and uh, gathering food making us all hungry here. <laughs> um, 
Um, I, I want to wrap the, the panel up just by going back to each of the, the speakers with, with just a couple of um, quick follow-up questions. Um, Sergio, you, a couple of things that really caught my attention in your presentation. You, you mentioned that um, going 100% renewable, w one of the motivations was to encourage ESG investment. Can you just say something about that? Because I think that, that's, that's the sort of argument which might have traction in a lot of boardrooms, which is which is different from the it's cool argument. I mean, it's cool will have, we'll have traction, yeah, because it's a business argument, right? It'll have traction with the CFO, so you know who's thinking about investor relations. Just say a little bit about um, how you think that this kind of clear leadership commitment can actually attract um, investors. It works. Okay. As, as I mentioned, uh, okay, on top of the coup, <laughs> so we always uh, also consider uh, uh, economic benefit uh, as a company because in order to have, uh, let's say, our long-term commitment by investing also our resources, uh, it should be the, uh, sustainable. It should be economically also sustainable simultaneously with uh, uh, our real uh, vision, cool vision. Then uh, we considered uh, four things, uh, more, tra uh, more growth, less risk, low cost, and more trust. And by doing the, any effort for the saving energy and the renewable energies uh, in our operations, it creates the, let's say, really the low cost operation and also the more efficient uh, operation and the processes that we have discussed a lot at the board members meeting and uh, we considered to commit the uh, renewable 100 or to commit zero carbon emission is definitely uh, return us the benefit as well. That kind of a discussion we have a lot of after the 2015 Paris and Paris Agreement and the SDGs. Uh, two years we are continuously discussed about these things, and now we are really convinced and committed to go forward for our future, our planet future, and for our businesses as well. Great, thank you. So the last question is about your vision of a net zero Japan and, and how you as a leading Japanese company and your peers might influence policy. Because uh, you know, many of us here are very concerned that the current trajectory is for Japan to actually be building a lot of new coal-fired power plants. So we have this one of the biggest, most modern economies in the world looking like it's going to invest in last century's energy technology and increase emissions, which is going in the opposite direction from your vision. So just give us a little sense of why is that happening and how might businesses like yours actually um, influence that to, to, to maybe even change that trajectory? Uh, firstly, <laughs> it's a quite dis uh, difficult questions. But firstly, as you may know, uh, the honestly speaking, infra infrastructure of the renewable energy in Japan is still pretty much well. And that's why it says the cost of renewable energies are so expensive, so high. It's almost four to five times of Germans. It's incredible. It's something wrong. But based on that, many, let's say, honestly speaking, uh, executives are considering the, let's say, uh, implementation of the sustainable uh, energies could be the disturbance of the economic growth or economic uh, improvement. That's, uh, that is our environmental situation in, in Japan. But honestly speaking, I believe that many Japanese companies have got the technologies, innovations in any areas, in many industries, uh, for also the for saving energies. So by having this kind of initiative and by uh, let's say promoting these uh, initiatives also in Japan, definitely many companies um, would contribute the 
the implementation of these uh, zero emission, zero carbon and uh, uh, renewable energies uh, societies uh, with their in, uh, technologies mm. in many industries. I, I believe so. So I strongly uh, request uh, every hundred initiative global movement that may let's say really encourage the Japanese companies as well. Yeah. So uh, I'm very proud of the being part of every hundred member. So I will talk a lot in Japan about this importance yeah. of the renewable energy and then uh, your global uh, let's say initiatives uh, definitely support uh, many Japanese executives to consider. Great. Okay. I'm going to come back to Helen and, and, and later to ask a little bit about um, how you see the growth of corporate commitments like this influencing policy, but may maybe there's some work for RE100 and Japanese CLP to do that. It sounds strange that renewables might cost four or five times um, coal in Japan, whereas they're cheaper than coal in, in, in many other economies. So, so it sounds like something to scratch the surface off a bit there. Um, Michael, oh, I, um, as I mentioned um, I was with a vehicle manufacturer the other day, and I'm really keen to understand what kind of, uh, what kind of interactions have you had with the vehicle manufacturers in sharing your vision. Um, you know, the, 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 if, if anyone doubts that electric vehicles are cool, there's lots of YouTube videos of um, t the Tesla Rati, as they're called, burning up um, Ferraris and Maseratis in, uh, in, in uh, uh, sort of drag races in America, and also of uh, uh, electric vehicle doubters being driven as passengers in Teslas and their, and their kind of faces just lighting up as they realize just how much instant torque there is in, a, in, a, in an electric vehicle. But uh, it seems that, again, here in Germany, there's some doubt or concerns about the pace of change. What, how do you see in your interactions with the vehicle manufacturers that they're playing this? Are they all in? Are they committed to 100% electric vehicles or are they hedging their bets on a, a possible slow transition from internal combustion engine? Well, obviously, we have 1.6 million cars, so we talk to these guys fairly often. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a change in picture. If you'd asked us, say, you know, a year ago, I think you could have considered it a fairly fringe issue, right? But then because of, uh, you know, the new regulations, also that announced the other day as part of the European Union mobility package, you know, initiatives like uh, EV100, I think we're starting also new, uh, you know, technologies coming uh, available, battery costs coming down, range increasing. There's, we, I think we need to think about the logic of tipping points here. And I think, you know, the OEMs are also understanding that we're reaching a tipping point, both in terms of public opinion, and they understand deeply themselves, of course, in terms of technology. So I think these two things are, are, are coming together. And, you know, you only have to open the newspapers. Every, you know, every week there's somebody you're saying we've got a new uh, electric engine uh, that we'll make available often by 2020, 2021. You know, Mini uh, will produce a, an, an e version of its, you know, of its car uh, in Oxford uh, also by 2021. So I think I think you're going to see a huge ramp up. Uh, and if you look at what are going to come out of the OEMs, you don't see much over the next year or so. But 2019, 2020, 2021, lots of new electric cars. And I think then. You, then it will be easier for people to to adopt as well. So, and that'll be a you know a virtuous reinforcing circle. And and it's going to be exponential, right? Which is always difficult to imagine because I hear people say, "Oh, we're only at one or two percent." But yeah. if you're at two percent and you double every two years, then you're at four, then eight, then sixteen. Before you know it, you're at sixty-four percent. Yeah. Well, you're you're right. I mean, if you look already at the figures, I mean, these just go up enormously. And what you see, <laughs> and it, that's again why EV100 is so interesting. You see that big corporates are saying, you know, we're going to go electric. Now, if you look at say five, six billion corporates, they might have say a thousand cars. We're going to switch them over the next four years. So if you get more and more companies that do this, more and more companies think it's not really, you know, uh, good for their image or good for their brand to have any other type of car. Then I think you're going to reach a demand tipping point. So yeah. Okay, let's hope so. And thank you for you helping it. Now I wanted to go back to to um, because it seems to me that often um, energy productivity is the poor relation of this in this triangle you know re100 renewable energy has beautiful windmills um, and, and and vast solar arrays some of them looking like pandas in the desert in China and all sorts of you know um, 
Michael, number one of the three was they're cool, right? I've never heard anyone say that energy efficiency is cool. LEDs can be cool. So, but but it seems that it's a it's a even though maybe the savings. Well, so let's let's get it. How, how do we convince? How do we take your experience to get more companies to realise that? Doubling energy productivity is feasible. It's kind of guaranteed returns. Um, um, so just tell us what are some of the barriers to getting more companies excited about um, bold commitments, not just on the, the, the things with big visual images, um, but with the, 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 the hard work, but the kind of low-hanging fruit and the guaranteed returns of energy productivity? Uh well, for us, from our experience, um, it's the way to go. Energy efficiency saves you a lot of money. The initial input might be um, very resource intensive in terms of getting the right technology, um, getting the right buy-in, and just mobilizing funds to invest uh, your initiatives into your initiatives. But in the long run, we have shown, and we can actually quantify now, um, that it's actually saving us a lot of money. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's the easiest way to, um, to encourage everyone to, to, you know. Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna hand to Helen, just to wrap, two, two questions, Helen. One, just give us the one or two kind of killer stories or facts or arguments of why, why every single company that we all know should be joining EP100. And secondly, maybe based on RE100, which is the most mature program, what are you seeing in terms of the power of big corporate demand signals to shift policymakers' perceptions about what's possible in terms of setting bold policy? Yeah, so the best, the story that I heard actually um, two days ago from Clay Nestler at Johnson Controls, who knows, really a, uh, was one of the founding companies for EP100, really passionate about it. He said that the money that they have saved would be equivalent to having to do an extra billion dollars of sales. So it's been hugely transformational because they have a 10% profit margin, I guess that means. Um, and so, you know, you can take it different ways into the bottom line. So that's just reason alone. It is cool because it's, it's money, essentially. And there's, it's money that a lot of companies are leaving on the floor. So don't. Um, We've got 30, 40 seconds, oh, over actually, but 40 seconds over, so it's now not the moment to do a kind of whole thing about system change theory. But what we, you know, if you dig into that and look at it, where policy often comes in most effectively when you're moving si systems is when you've actually already reached a tipping point. So policy rarely actually drives the tipping point. It's very good at locking in tipping points that are already happening. And that's what we're seeing with sort of RE and EV, is you get this tipping point, you send that demand signal out there and that allows policymakers to come in and say right now we're going to lock that down and you see the confidence from countries now stepping forward and saying right we're going to set this 2040 uh, we've seen that in the UK and, and other places they could only do that because they're already seeing the markets move really and then that moves things on again and so you get into this really good um, dynamic between the two great thank you um, well uh, um, we've come to the end of our time here it seems to me that we've heard um, very convincing um, arguments that science-based targets, um, I mean, pretty much has become a new normal. I mean, those figures are about 320 companies already and another 960 planning to do so in the next two years in the alignment with capital markets. Um, and some great examples of the way that BT and EDP are using those really ambitious targets to drive not just um, emissions reduction, but new business opportunities, innov innovative business models. Um, within their own operations and in terms of their engagement with clients and, and, and up the supply chain as well. And then I think now we've just heard from this panel of the, the, the power, um, the power of very clear, bold uh, objectives um, to get stuff done, to motivate innovation, but also to send very strong signals to peers, customers, and policymakers to create that those virtuous circles of raised ambition in one part of the system, raising ambition in another part of the system, which means everyone gets much more confident that we can go faster to the future. And, and let's face it, we need that. So thank you to both of our panels. Um, enjoy the rest of your time here in Bonn. Um, and let's all get um, the 100% transition done. Thank you. May I suggest uh, one group photo? Of course. We had both panels. Yeah. yeah.
Just please come to uh, close to the stage around here. It's a 360 oh, camera, this so is a, this is a Rico don't technology. worry the position. Any po any position in a room, you can be taken. It's not necessary to come to. It's 360. It's, it's 360. 360. Remote there. wireless Rico. Uh, stay there. <laughs> stay there, Alberto. Look at yeah. look at this black black box. Okay, are you ready? Ready. 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 Okay. One, two, three, go. Okay, just taken. <laughs> Already. <laughs> By the way, we call this camera is SDGs camera. Do you know why? Why? No one left behind. <laughs> 